so recently I set about the task of training my own AI, a custom GPT is what it's called. And I was inspired to do so based on a video I watched uh, featuring Don, Don Ashburn, aka Mr. Grateful. Uh, Mr. Grateful uh, was featured on 19 Keys. And I was pretty impressed with the young man and how he expressed himself. And I was very uh, inspired by his story. That was many months ago, and I had forgotten about the entire thing. Until recently, a relative of mine uh, shared a uh, interview he had on the Callum show. And whereas the 19 Keys interview was three hours, this one was two hours. And so I decided to apply some of the recommendations that Mr. Grateful uh, put out there about how to make better use of artificial intelligence, in this case, ChatGPT. So, let me show you a few things that I did. So, first it began. The process begins with getting the data together that you're going to use to train this artificial intelligence. So this is called creating a custom GPT. When you're creating a custom GPT, it contains all the knowledge that you want it to have that's relevant to the task that you're going to put it to. In this case, I'm creating a C++ development GPT. And I wanted to know as much about C++ and things related to C++ as I can possibly um, have it understand. Now, the information that I've gathered here is information primarily from what's called the GNU project. So GNU is an organization that is affiliated with GNOME and basically what they do is they provide standards for software development in the Linux environment. And so because Linux is open source, then I'm able to access information of a wider and broader variety than I normally would be able to in any other uh, environment. So one of the things that I did is I had a very detailed conversation with ChatGPT. I had a conversation about how I can best create a GPT based on the advice from Dom Ashburn, Mr. Grateful, and ChatGPT as of August 2024 was able to search the internet in real time. I watched it do it. And it was able to understand who Dom Ashburn was, what Dom Ashburn typically recommends, and was able to use that in advising me in how to best put together information for the purposes of creating a custom AI assistant that is designed to my standards. One of the things that I did was I gave it some of my articles that I had written. I've written technical articles since 2011. And so I wanted it to have some context and some idea of the way that I write, the way that I think. And of course, the AI doesn't actually think as we understand it but rather it does what's called word prediction. But the better focused the words are, the more relevant the advice is going to be. So this is one of my first attempts to build a C++ assistant, a custom AI. And I ran into a few limitations, and so I had to go back to the drawing board, and I learned that there's a 20 file limitation when you're uploading files to this GPT. And keep in mind, the day before this, I had spent so much time putting files together. I had amassed so much information over the day or two days prior to this. I was so disappointed that I couldn't upload all the files at once that I had put together. And so I deep dived into this 
um, situation to the scenario. And I said, there's got to be a way. And of course, it didn't take me very long. I wanted to find a workaround. I wanted to use all of my knowledge on how to manipulate information and amass information to accomplish the objective. Here it says each file can be up to 512 megabytes in size and can contain over uh, about 2 million tokens. So if you can upload 20 uh, files maximum and the maximum file size is about 512 megabytes, which is half a gigabyte, then that means that you can amass approximately 10 gigabytes worth of data that you can pose to your uh, custom AI assistant. And that is that can constitute a vast amount of data. The thing about it is, is that although it's written there saying that each file can be up to 512 megabytes, in practice, ChatGPT, as of August uh, 2024, is not going to allow you to upload a file that large into the uh, web-based version of ChatGPT. Now you can uh, get a subscription where you can write code behind the scenes and go very deep that way to get data into the AI, but I wasn't about to spend that amount of time. I can do it, I'm capable of doing it, but I was on a very limited time uh, um, budget, you might say. Um, it was uh, I had a few days off and I had to use that time very productively so this is the approach that I took so I said plan B would be that I would create several GPTs so I would so I created up to 10 of them uh, or tried to create up to 10 of them and they were going to slice and dice uh, C++ from different angles right so I would have C++ uh, assistance of varying types that would all work together as a swarm as it were well that didn't work because um, apparently I had ran into some type of limitation in terms of the data and so I went on the forums for OpenAI to get some clarity on that and I didn't quite get any clarity so I decided that um, you know after um, you know several minutes of going through the knowledge base and seeing what kind of limitations exist because I need to know the limitations so I can know what I can what I can work within right and I basically uh, reached a, a point in, in my own mind where I was like you know let let's just uh, work with what we got and I really would just want one AI assistant rather than 10 anyway you know and so I said what other approach could I take that could possibly get around some of these limitations, save me an immense amount of time, and where I would not have to go back to the drawing board? Because the other way to do this is you could actually write your own knowledge base. You could write it, but I decided that's not quite what I wanted to do. So here is my second attempt at building a AI assistant and it was much more successful and I had better success here and one of the ways I did that is I took that vast knowledge base I didn't have to give up anything I just basically used PDF merge I merged PDFs together it is true that the way you organize the information that you give to the um, to the AI assistant matters a great deal and so I put a little bit of effort into that but I um, I put more effort into the actual overall configuration of the AI assistant and so I was able to have a conversation with this AI assistant at some point that allowed me to uh, take all the information that I uploaded and put it uh, in context but I wanted to double check these file restrictions and I wanted to make sure that um, I didn't have any problems in the future because if you noticed in that earlier uh, screenshot I had up to 11 files so that gave me um, nine additional files that I could use in order to configure the GPT so I didn't want to use I didn't want to upload 20 files total I want to do it do this in fewer files if I could 
I, do, I would use one file if I could. One half a gigabyte file would suffice for me at this point. But um, I saw that there were some, some limitations in uploading files to ChatGPT. So anyway, I moved on past that. I was satisfied with just having 11 files, right? Um, at least it wasn't 20. That means I have room to grow if I decide I want to add something. So I focused on an actual dialogue with the AI assistant. So as you're creating this AI assistant, you can talk to it and in talking to it a certain way in a very meticulous and very specific and focused way, you can, conf have, you can configure it, you can adjust it so that um, all the knowledge that you uploaded, there's a context to all of it, right? Now, one of the things that I did upload to the knowledge base is an actual full-on conversation. That, com that long, lengthy, one-hour, one-and-a-half-hour conversation that I had with ChatGPT, which, by the way, ChatGPT was unable to um, download or produce a PDF for me. I, was, I have enough skills where I was able to get around that, and I created my own PDF of the entire conversation, and then I translated that to text. Anyway, so I uploaded that up into, um, the, into this AI assistant that I'm building so that it would, it would reinforce everything that I'm saying. So that main conversation is my key. That's the key that pulls it all together so that if it ever, if there's any internal confusion, and I really know, I know when I say things like that, I really should stop myself because this isn't a thing that knows. It doesn't have actual intelligence. And I know that. And that's why I'm so comfortable with this process because, again, um, and this is hard to get across to everyone, but the a what is called an AI, it really is um, what's called a word predictor. That's all it does is it predicts the likelihood of the next words that you're going to use, right? So, knowing that, what I'm trying to do, or what I am successfully doing at this uh, point, is I am making sure the words that it is going to use in order to solve the problems that I'm going to pose to it in the future is limited to those words that will generate the best quality result. That's the overall objective with this type of technology. Because the AI assistant is going to translate whatever I give it into an output. It's, a, it's actually a program that deals with programs, right? So notice here I am putting in some restrictions. I'm putting in some constraints. These are design constraints in how it behaves, how it operates. See, regular ChatGPT is open-ended. And it only becomes more narrow the more you talk to it. That was um, a point that was very uh, clearly and well communicated by Mr. Grateful. Uh, Mr. Grateful on the, on the uh, Callum show, he explained that flawlessly. And it was beautiful. And so that's the thing you want to do here is make sure that you are... Uh, narrowing the context to a level that is going to boost the odds statistically that what is produced by this AI assistant is far more relevant to what you're trying to do and simultaneously you're uh, raising the quality of the result to a higher level. So that's what I'm doing here and that's why I'm keeping things much more uh, strict because in my actual experience which I'm sharing with this AI assistant the things that I am programming it with are those things that have a lower uh, rate of error a lower defect rate so if I just turn it loose on all of C++ from C++ 98 to C++ 11 to C++ 14 to C++ 17, to C++ 2020, to C++ 2023. There is too much room for error in that, okay? The fact is, right now, 
in August 2024. The most stable version of C++ is C++17 in terms of the newest C++. There are newer, um, uh, what do you call standards, revisions of C++, but they have not been fully implemented across the board yet. And so if you look at the documentation in August 2020 for the GNU compiler collection, it will let you know that um, support for C20 and C23, it's all experimental. Actually, C23 is labeled highly experimental, and C20 is labeled experimental. C17 has been stable for many years, so I'd rather use something that's stable, and I want the AI here not to give me something that is, um, you know, next generation, and then when I copy and paste it as code into a project, it fails in the tools that I'm actually using and that the majority of people have access to because the actual uh, suggestions are on shaky ground. So that's one of the, the insights, keep that in mind, one of the insights that I am implanting into this AI assistant. Now, should C20 become more stable after a time, I could see creating a new version of this, right? I would keep this one, right? Because why, why break something, you know, that's already working well? I would create a, a sibling C++ development assistant that's trained on C++20. So anyway, um, so here I'm putting various uh, standards in place. I'm putting in um, a, a wide range of criteria. And what this will do is um, limit the code suggestions to that which is going to be much more practical and code that will require the least amount of rework. And my uh, goal is to get it to a point where it generates code that requires no rework and that produces code at a senior software developer, senior engineer level, if not a, a highly expert hands-on software architect level, but one step at a time. It's enough that it can, that I have the possibility here to build an AI assistant that's going to produce code that is commensurate with my experience and my insights so that it's working with me rather than me toiling for hours trying to coax it in the right direction, which on some days it, it goes totally left field no matter what you do. And then on other days, you know, it might be um, very close, but never 100%. So by reducing the amount of um, false, uh, false starts and um, incomplete results and subpar results, then I can boost my productivity with this particular tool. So I spent 72 hours, right? Well, let's just say three days. I spent three days on this, on this process, right? So this isn't as easy as um, this may appear. There's quite a bit of pre-work that went into this. And again, there, there was many rejections that took place in terms of, you know, there were limits in files and there were limits in this and that, but I found workarounds for those. And the, the main workaround that I found, um, which, you know, I, I'm at peace with, you know, it works for me, you know, is basically to um, merge all the information into, um, you know, fewer files. So I didn't have a problem with that. Um, the only downside to that is, you know, the merging process is fine. Again, I left the hint earlier when I said, 
it's how you organize the files. So I think I struck the right balance in the amount of time I spent organizing the files. Because one of the things that I did is I put metadata around some of the files to leave it clues, right? So for example, when building, uh, when compiling code and when building packages like RPMs and deb, deb files, um, I put metadata around some of those types of files so that it would, that it would um, you know, uh, know what those files are and the context of those files in relation to everything else. So I have a way of writing C++ code that um, emphasizes memory safety. Uh, first and foremost, and I'm programming that into this um, process as we speak, right? Or at least um, letting it know what my preferences are in terms of the type of code it would generate, where we're not trying to create, you know, uh, 1980s and 1990s style um, uh, hacker level code that, you know, is like the most. Uh, uh, amazing leet code level kind of stuff where you know you you split bits and you do all this kind of stuff nobody has time for that we want clean well abstracted code that's easy to read that compiles well does what it uh, supposed to at face value and you don't have to like uh, try to decipher um, long macro instructions and uh, template hierarchies and all this kind of stuff. So this is a test. So um, because I also programmed in um, uh, desktop uh, GUI programming, right? Um, C, uh, programming GUIs in C++ using the GTK or GTK MM uh, libraries and toolkits. And so I asked it a question here. And this question is, um, it's pretty perfect in a way because it's not so um, theoretical, right? When you first talk to GPT on many subjects of a technical nature, it can very easily go theoretical with you, right? And you have, and I've never seen it respond like this, right? Where it's so specific, right? But this reflects the data, the knowledge base that I fed it and um, I'm actually pleased on this first run. And so by this time, I'm quite tired, right? Um, going through this process, I, I'm, uh, I'm quite tired at this point. It's, l it's later, later in the evening, but I'm quite satisfied um, of, about what has been accomplished. So I think this, the future is gonna be bright with this. And um, once I, uh, you know, uh, get a little bit more strength built back up. I'm going to um, create another GPT to go along with this, but um, I think this is going to be a, a very productive tool for translating what I call project specifications into actionable, reliable, production-grade results. And one of the things I've learned going through this process is that the use of ChatGPT is very much like uh, being a tech lead and being a tech manager, project manager, and architect, more so than just a, a someone who writes code. And I think that's a good exercise to engage. So I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of my C++ development assistant and how I constructed it. And if you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to um, post a comment and um, I, will, I will catch you uh, on the next one. Um, have fun.